Hi, it's me. It's time to learn about TJ, my TG favorite president of all time, and a little bit about J Madge because we're going to be talking about the War of 1812 too, so let's get started. During this time period, we see the rise of nationalism, which is the idea that we are number one, we want to focus on America and not anybody else. So one way we could do that is how Thomas Jefferson said to uh, fight the crusade against ignorance, which meant that he and the Republicans or the Democratic Republicans wanted to educate the nation. They wanted to set up a free public schooling system for all male citizens. Well, at the time that really didn't work. Most places didn't have anything like that. Uh, the most common thing that we saw is that institutions were private institutions and only were being attended by those who could afford to pay. So many times when we saw the schooling, it was mostly um, the aristocracy that were being in the schools and they were being trained to become more elite than the others. We didn't really see anything for the poor. When it came to women, it was more about teaching them how to be a Republican mother. The idea of Republican motherhood is to raise your children to be Republicans and be part of this country, be good citizens. That was their job at the time. Also at the time we were trying to figure out how to educate the, as Jefferson called them, noble savages, the Indians, and the way he felt to make them noble and to make them assimilate to our culture was to teach them basically how to be white. And that happened a little bit, but not too much. African Americans are like, let me have schooling. And the whites were like, no, you, you don't need to be educated, unfortunately. Um, if we did see any type of higher education, we're talking about college level universities. None were public. They were all private and only those who could afford to go did. About one in 1,000 males went. No women, no African Americans, and no Indians attended these schools. In order to become a doctor at the time, basically you had to be an apprentice to a doctor that was already in the field. And the methods they were using were actually very dangerous and pretty much useless. This is one of the ways that George Washington died was because of the techniques of what they called bleeding and purging, which isn't really the best idea. So doctors are like, well, maybe we should probably, I don't know, use science and logic to actually treat people. So we started to see the profession grow from here. At the time, the United States is not only trying to get away from Europe politically and become isolationist, but they also wanted to get away from Europe culturally. They wanted cultural independence when it came to uh, literary and artistic um, achievements, and we wanted to make sure that we could rival those that we saw in Europe, because most people at the time, if they're going to read anything, it was going to be usually English literature. Well, some ways that we got away from them was with spelling and with our dictionaries, and that was pure and, and American school books, which were created at the time mostly by Noah Webster. He wanted a patriot education, he wanted people to become patriotic and nationalist, so he created the American Spelling Book and the American Dictionary where he pretty much dumbed down our language, dropped the U's, dropped some of the letters, so that basically we're simplifying our language um, to be different from the English language. At the time, we see literacy rates go up and there's large reading throughout the Republic due to some things like newspapers and political pamphlets, but we still wanted to get our books published. Now, most of the time, English books were the ones that are being published because they were cheaper to do, so it was really hard for an American author to get published, but there were some that did at the time, and they were some of the famous ones. Number one, Charles Brockton Brown. He is considered one of our most ambitious and famous um, novelist before James Fenimore Cooper. He is probably considered the greatest one before him. We also see Washington Irving, who writes a bunch of satirical novels and tales, including those of Rip Van Winkle and Ichabod Crane. And we're also seeing historians write um, textbooks. We see Marisota, Mercy Otis Warren. He wrote uh, The History of the Revolution in 1805. And we see uh, Mason Weems, all, mostly known, most people know him by Parson Weems, write The Life of Washington in 1806. And they did this in order to instill nationalism in the country. The United States is also seeing at the time a rise of religious skepticism. People are starting to reject it because after the revolution we see a detachment from the church and we see more people focusing on liberty and reason since the government believes in the separation of church and state. So a lot of people are embracing the idea of deism that there is a God but he may be earth and just kind of snap back and just that's it, wash the sands of it. Um, some people re attack religion as superstitious including uh, one of the famous <clears throat> authors of the time, Thomas Paine, T. Paine, who wrote The Age of Reason that basically said that how could you follow religion like Christianity when they kill and martyr their own leaders. Um, skepticism led to universalism and Unitarianism, which started in New England, but then later 
uh, spread throughout the country. It rejected predestination. It said that salvation was for anybody and that Jesus was just a good teacher. He was not the son of God. And this spread of what they called rationalism led to uh, less commitment to organized churches and denominations were just considered too formal and too traditional. And this will upset some people that are of the religious faith and are going, we're going to see a comeback with this and it's no more. By the 1790s, we're seeing the start of the Second Great Awakening, which was basically the spread of Baptist, Presbyterian, and Methodist churches. And their main focus was to combat these new light dissenters, these people who believe, these religious skeptics, the ones that believed in this rationalism. Um, by 1800, we're seeing it start in Yale and, and really uh, push off towards the West because we see a lot of preachers, you know, um, produce this religious frenzy that we're seeing at the time with the Second Great Awakening. Um, they wanted it with this to have people readmit God and Christ into their life and reject this skeptical uh, rationalism that they were seeing. They said that we're seeing new sects created, but it wasn't just like old ones being reestablished, but we're seeing new ones spread out. And they do reject uh, predestination like the skeptics do, but they're also saying that you do get salvation through good faith and good works. Women at the time, they were particularly in favor of this. They liked it because basically it helped them um, push their beliefs. And there was a lot of women in certain regions where it was really popular. Also, industrial workers at the home preferred it as well. Even um, blacks and black preachers of the South really enjoyed it too because it was their way of saying, hey, we can get salvation, and it also promoted the idea of freedom for them and equality. Uh, Native Americans did like it as well. They did um, in the South. We saw a lot of missionaries go there to help convert them. And in the North, we see Prophet Hanson Lake encourage Christianity among his Iroquois people, but he also encouraged them at the same time to embrace and restore their culture. The United States at the time is also seeing the start of the Industrial Revolution. Why? Because of major important technologies that we're seeing in America. Now, at the time, we already saw in England they're having their Industrial Revolution, and they were trying to hide all of their new technologies from the rest of the world. But remember, immigrants are coming to our country every day, and they're kind of taking those ideas with them. For instance, Samuel Slater was an immigrant, and he started the first mill in, um, or the first factory in the United States in Rhode Island in 1790. We're also seeing other inventors in the United States do things like Oliver Evans, who created the first automated flour mill, and of course Eli Whitney, he revolutionized our technology with the uh, weapon, with weaponry, and with uh, the cotton gin in 1793. With the cotton gin, basically it, it separated um, seeds, cotton seeds from the cotton, which uh, allowed for a tremendous amount of cotton to be created and made and quickly so that was very important for the South, and also because it became so popular, it extended the um, popularity of slavery in the South as well. And with that, with so much cotton being created, the North or the New England textile industry exploded as well. And we're seeing more entrepreneurs in the North creating these uh, factories and industries because of the cotton gin. Also, at the time, this was really important because the interchangeable parts that he created, not only for the cotton gin, but for weapons with, that were used in the quasi-war versus France under John Adams' presidency, basically helped to use um, interchangeable parts in different machineries and different products. Guess what? When you're making stuff, you don't just keep it. You need to get rid of it and sell it. And how do you do that? Well, you got to transport it somewhere. So we're seeing many innovations in transportation at the time. And because we really didn't have anything, we're starting to see many innovations. So we started taking over things, especially overseas trade, and Congress actually passed a tariff to even promote our American shipbuilding and our American ports to promote transportation even more. So we're seeing us take over many of the trading and shipping industries when it comes to that, when it comes to us trading with Europe. And we also are starting to see not only trade overseas, but trade between states, interstate trade, and transport of um, goods from the north to the south, basically, and we're seeing that on the river. So how is that happening? How are we getting it done quickly? Well, Oliver Evans, he had invented the efficient steam engine for the boats, and then Robert Fulton and Robert Livingston were the ones that perfected the steamboat and brought that to national attention with their ship, the Claremont. Um, after that, we're starting to see turnpikes being created, which is just a road. In 1792, corporations were building it. They were using it as toll roads, but it did. they needed to turn a profit, so the only time they really used them was in densely populated areas. 
Most people at the time were living an agrarian lifestyle, meaning they were living on farms. Only about 3% of people lived in towns greater than 8,000, but we are starting to see some changes. Our two biggest cities at the time, New York and Philadelphia, were large and complex, but they weren't, they didn't rival those of London and, and Paris, but they were kind of about the same size as some of the secondary cities in Europe. Uh, but the urban lifestyle did produce affluent people, and they wanted basically elegance and, and amenities and luxuries and different things, and they also wanted entertainment like music, theater, dancing, and the favorite pastime at the time, horse racing. All right, time to talk about my T2 president. That would be TJ, what his presidency was like. He lived, He was the second president to live in the White House in Washington, D.C., that first one, of course, being John Adams. Um, but what was Washington, D.C. like at the time? Well, it was created by a French architect known as Pierre L'Enfant, and he created it on a grand scale, but at the same time, at the same time, Washington was kind of like a provincial village with a very few public buildings. We're going to see it obviously expand over time. Jefferson, basically, as a president, he was very simple. He believed in making his image plain. He was very much against the idea of being pretentious or aristocratic, and he just eliminated that aura of the president being a majesty, basically the president being a king. You know, he tried to get rid of that. He was an absolute political genius. He worked as the leader of his party, and he gave the Republicans in Congress direction on what to do. He used his appointments as a political weapon, and he won re-election in 1804 very easily. Yo, oh, yo, oh, a pirate's life for me. We pillage, we plunder, we rifle and loot. Bring up the hotties, yo, ho. We kidnap and ravage and don't get a hoot. Bring up the hotties, yo, ho. Yo, ho, yo, ho, a pirate's life for me. We so, guess who had to deal with pirates? Yes, that would be TJ. He had to deal with some pirates on the sea. <laughs> All right, I'm done. All right, so before we talk about the pirates that he had to deal with, he, we have to talk about some money issues that they were having at the time. Washington Adams had increased the debt, and Jefferson basically told Congress that they had to get rid of all internal taxes and leaving only land sales and custom duties cut the government spending and he cut the debt in half because he felt that the national government shouldn't be the one spending the money. He also scaled down the armed forces, he cut the navy because he felt like if we make that too big we're hurting our civil liberties and we needed to have more of a civilian government not a military government and he promoted the overseas commerce instead of promoting agriculture. At the same time he did establish West Point, the U.S. Military Academy in 1802 at Eventually, he did have to build up the Navy because of the pirates that they had to deal with off the Barbary Coast. Sorry, the Navy. At the time, Jefferson had to fight the courts because the court was pretty much led by Federalists, and he was a Republican. So what did he try to do? He had Congress help them repeal the Judiciary Act of 1801 that eliminated the judgeships that Adams filed before he left office as a, as a Federalist that made all of these um, judges Federalists. Well, some people didn't like it, including the Justice of Peace, William Marbury. He took it to court against James Madison, who was the Secretary of State at the time. So this is the court case of Marbury versus Madison, one of the top five court cases of all time in the United States. Supreme Court ruled that Congress exceeded its authority in creating a statute on the Judiciary Act of 1789. Therefore, it was unconstitutional. And the court assessed that the act of Congress was completely void by doing this, it enlarged their power. This is what established judicial review. It's very important for you to understand that. Who decided this? Chief Justice John Marshall, one of the greatest ju chief justices of all time. And it basically, this showed that the judiciary was as equal of a branch as that of the executive and the legislative. Jefferson tried to get rid of some of these Federalist judges by impeaching a few, including uh, Samuel Chase. Now remember the he can't impeach, but he can ask Congress to do so. Well, the House impeached him, but the Senate could not get that two-thirds vote necessary to remove him from office. So this acquittal, or letting the guy go, set the precedent that impeachment wasn't just a political weapon, but it had to, you couldn't just use it for that, that partisan politics was going to be involved. Got to talk about Napoleon a little bit before we talk about Jefferson. He wanted to dominate the world. This little guy, he had world domination. He had little guy issues, so he felt like by dominating the world and making him a bigger man. Well, he tried for India and it didn't work, so he went after the New World. Well, Spain held most of the land west of the Mississippi, but 
Napoleon was able to get some of that land from them in 1800 with the uh, Treaty of San Ildefonso. Well, after that, Jefferson thought, hey, I'll go and be friends with this guy. We need to be pro-French. And they didn't, he didn't realize that um, Napoleon was trying to take over this land. But it just kind of worked out in his favor. He wasn't able to take over any of the area of the New World for a couple of reasons. Number one, he really, really, really needed money to take over, try to take over Europe. And number two, his all the soldiers that were stationed in this area of the New World were dying of yellow fever. So he struck up a deal with the Americans to sell that area to the French, or to the Americans, sorry, from the French, known as the Louisiana Purchase. Jefferson was skeptical about signing it, but in 1803, he did purchase that land from Napoleon for $15 million. Robert Livingston and James Murrow were in France negotiating this deal. They really didn't have the authority to do so, but they just kind of did it anyway, with the, and they purchased it again for $15 million. <laughs> Jefferson really was skeptical about doing this because it wasn't anywhere in the Constitution that they were able to do this, but he decided to go with it. And it was actually a threefold land transfer that went from Spain to France and then to the United States. And with that, we're eventually going to see governments organize in the Louisiana Territory like they did in the Northwest Territories, where eventually they would become states as long as they had enough people and got a Constitution. When we got this new land, we really didn't know much about it, so President Jefferson wanted to send an expedition to the Pacific coast to see what this land was all about and find geographical facts and investigate different trade routes and people to trade with throughout the area, especially the Indians. So he sent Meriwether Lewis and William Clark on this expedition from the Mississippi River at St. Louis to the Pacific coast. They had uh, the Indian Sacagawea help them reach the Pacific coast in a matter of a year. He did send other people on different expeditions at the time. He sent uh, Lieutenant Zebulon Pike from the Mississippi to explore the Rocky Mountains. Next, we're going to talk about the Burr Conspiracy. Here's the situation. With the expansion of Louisiana Territory, the Federalists didn't like that because they felt like with more land, it's going to weaken the central government, which they were big proponents of. Well, they decided, well, if we don't like this, we're just going to secede from the Union. So they tried to rally up New York, New Jersey, and parts of New England to secede, but Alexander Hamilton, their biggest um, leader, really refused to accept this. So they went after Aaron Burr. They knew that maybe if they got him to be governor of New York in 1804, he would be a part of this plan. Well, Hamilton knew about it, and he accused Burr and these excess junk, though, who were part of this conspiracy of treason and said negative remarks about him. And when Aaron Burr lost the governorship, he blamed Hamilton for it. He said it was his fault that he lost. So he challenged Hamilton to a duel, and Hamilton's like, whatever. So they fought the duel, but Hamilton actually got mortally wounded because of this duel when he thought it was just a joke. Aaron Burr obviously didn't take it as a joke. So because of that, he knew he killed him. Aaron Burr fled to the West, and he, along with General James Wilkinson, who was the governor of the Louisiana Territory, plotted together to capture Mexico from the Spanish and make it a new empire. Well... They found out about it. He got caught in 1806. He was tried for treason, but for some reason did become acquitted. But what did this whole thing show? It just basically showed that the bigger the empire got of the United States, the weaker it, the central government became. Now we're going to see a conflict on the seas. We are right now the um, number one group controlling trade between Europe and the West Indies. Well, because France and Britain were still fighting with each other and Napoleon's continental system where he basically blocked any goods coming in from Britain, it's going to be a problem. So because of them fighting, we get stuck in the middle of it. We're trying to trade with Europe because um, Napoleon won't let things come into Berlin or Milan, whereas Britain's saying, no, you have to send everything to us before you send anything to the other places. Now, who do we get more upset with? Britain. They were the worst offenders because not only were they doing this to us, but they were seizing our ships and they were actually um, using the... Um, system of impressment, meaning taking their sailors and making them part of their armed services. With this policy of impressment, we're seeing that the British Navy is forcing service upon the people that they capture, and they use many, as many uh, merchants as possible when, they, when Americans are trying to take goods over to Europe. Well, there are many people who, de many of these Americans who deserted as possibly, uh, as quickly as they could, and they joined the Americans. But to stop this fuss, the British would claim the right to stop and search any American ship. And if they found any people on this ship that they felt were deserters, they would re-impress them, meaning put them back into their armed services. 
Well, there was an incident in 1807 that was kind of the straw that broke the camel's back. It was the Chesapeake Le uh, Leopard incident where the British fired on a U.S. ship because they refused to be searched. And the U.S. minister at the time to Britain, James Monroe, protested and Great Britain refused to renounce any of the impressments that they had made upon American merchants. Jefferson's response to this problem that we're having with shipping over between Britain and France was to set the embargo of 1807, which basically prevented U.S. ships from leaving the United States to any foreign port. He was trying to protect them, but it was bad because it led to a major depression in the country. Uh, New England ship owners and builders and merchants were the ones that got hit the hardest. When James Madison ran for president in 1808, when he won, the first thing he basically did was end the embargo, and he replaced it with the Non-Intercourse Act, which basically said we could trade with whoever except for Britain and France. Later, we see that in 1810, the Macon's Bill Number 2 basically opened trade again with Britain and France, but the president could prohibit anything if the um, two countries went against any type of neutral trading that we had with them. Napoleon eventually announced, though, that he was going to no longer interfere with our trading because he was having problems in Europe. So Madison just issued a, an embargo against Great Britain. He used this to it, it, its advantage. And with this, he basically said, you have to stop harassing our ships until we start um, trading with you again. And Britain did because of that. This is what was known as the peaceable coercion. You're forcing someone into a decision, but without war. After the dislodgement by Americans, the Native Americans or the Indians at the time were looking to the Brits for protection against the Americans. They were in Canada at the time, if you're wondering where the heck the British are. William Henry Harrison, at the time, he was a major supporter of westward expansion. He was going to later become President of the United States just for a little bit. And Jefferson appointed him governor of Indiana at the time. So he offered the Indians an ultimatum. You either stay here, become like the white farmers and assimilate, or you have to move west to the Mississippi. But by um, 1807, the tribes started to cede their land, and after the Chesapeake incident and the Chesapeake Leonard incident, the British began to renew their friendship with the Indians when they were pretty ticked off at us. But um, they had to defend it against an invasion into Canada. The white settlers had to worry about two new major leaders of the Indians. That would be Tecumseh and the Prophet. The Prophet was an Indian leader who rejected white culture and said that we need that the Indians needed to unite in order to fight them back and he united thousands of tribes um, many of them at Tippecanoe Creek and his brother Tecumseh led the joint effort to oppose white civilization and gather as many tribes as they could to unite against them. Uh, the started in 1809 they began to unite the Mississippi Valley and by 1811 they went to the south to try to unite tribes there to fight against the whites. So in 1811 at the Battle of Tippecanoe he, the whites uh, led by William Henry Harrison, fought against Prophet and his tribe, and he defeated the Prophet's followers and destroyed the tri tribal confederacy that the Prophet and Tecumseh had built. However, they still had to, the whites still had to fight off Indian um, and fight with them in skirmishes throughout 1812, and who encouraged this? The British that were in Canada. So at the time, they the um, Americans were feeling that the only way that they could get the British to stop the Indians from attacking them was to invade Canada, where the British were. There are a lot of people promoting and wanting expansion at the time. Frontiersmen in the north wanted to expand into Canada, and those in the south wanted to acquire Florida in order to stop Indian attacks, stop the um, runaway slaves, and also to gain access to river ports and to the Gulf of Mexico. Well, in 1810, settlers in western Florida captured the Spanish fort of Baton Rouge, and President Madison said it was okay and that they could annex this territory. Well, this made the British mad because they were allies of Spain, so it kind of made the pretext of war. Many people didn't want war, but those who did want war were known as war hawks, and they were elected in 1810 in the uh, midterm election to Congress, and some of these nationalists, these war hawks, were for territorial expansion, so they were all about attacking Canada and, it's, and, and gaining Florida as well. Who were the two major war hawks? That would be Speaker of the House Henry Clay of Kentucky and John C. Calhoun of South Carolina. They led the Republicans in pressing toward this Canadian invasion. So on June 18, 1812, Madison declared war on the British and invaded Canada. At first, the Americans weren't doing too well against the British. They were forced to surrender Detroit and Fort Dearborn, which is now known as Chicago, in the first few months. And on the sea, though, the Americans were pretty successful 
Um, but by 1813, when the British didn't have to fight Napoleon so much after his defeat in Russia, they were devoting all of their resources and imposing blockades on the Americans. But the U.S. had some successes. They had some success in the Great Lakes. Oliver Perry was able to beat the Brits at the Put-in-Bay in 1813, and he born their capital of York. William Henry Harrison was victorious at the Battle of Thames, which really disheartened the natives who were in support of the British and who were fighting with the British for the British's ability to take the Northwest, because now the Americans were taking the Northwest back, which is what we call the Midwest. Another war hero at the time was Andrew Jackson. He defeated the Creek Indians at the Battle of Horseshoe Bend in 1814. And at the time, he was also moving his way down into Florida to take Florida and Pensacola in 1814. In 1814, after Napoleon had surrendered to the British, the British planned on the invasion of the United States. So in 1814, they landed in the Chesapeake region and they captured and burned Washington. This is when the White House, the first White House that was built was burned to the ground. Americans at Fort Henry in Baltimore were able to repel the British in September of 1814, and this battle is what inspired Francis Scott Key to write our national anthem known as the Star Spangled Banner. British were also repelled in New York if, uh, at the Battle of Plattsburgh in uh, September of 1814, and then a little bit later in January of 1815, Andrew Jackson got his notoriety at the national level for winning the Battle of New Orleans. Ironically enough, the Treaty of Ghent, which ended the war, had already been signed months before. During this whole time, from 1812 to 1815, New England was getting really upset and sick of the United States government. They were opposed to the war. They were mostly Federalists, so they opposed the Republican government that was in charge. And um, Daniel Webster, who was a Federalist, led the congressional opposition. At the time, it seems it's kind of ironic because he seemed more for states' rights at the time and eventually is going to push for nationalism, where we're going to see John C. Calhoun, who was for nationalism at the time, later on push for states' rights. The Federalists of the New England dreamed of a separate nation to escape this tyranny of slaveholders and backwoodsmen. They felt like we, they were completely different, and they didn't want to be a part of that anymore. So in December of 1814, they had the Hartford Convention, which was at night. They were trying to think of ways to kind of put themselves in their own separate area, not necessarily to secede, but to put states' rights above the national rights. But nothing happened. Why? For two reasons. Number one, the news of Andrew Jackson's big win in the Battle of New Orleans, and also because of the signing of the Treaty of Ghent, which ended the War of 1812. In 1814, in August of 1814, uh, John Quincy Adams, Henry Clay, and Albert Gallatin met in Ghent, Belgium, with British diplomats. The only thing that really got done was that the war ended. Um, nothing else really got resolved. The British refused to uh, drop their policy of impressment, and we basically, they dropped our call to have a buffer zone for the Indians in the Northwest. Um, the British, British accepted the terms because they were exhausted. They, they were broke because of not only the war of as well, but the Napoleonic War that they had been fighting before. So we believe that we had ended the conflict with Europe over commercial interference that we were having. This is what this whole thing was about. We were ticked off at them for stopping our ships from shipping things to Europe. So in December of 1814, the Treaty of Ghent was signed. Eventually later, that a free trade agreement would be signed in 1815. And the rush Bagot Agreement of 1817 eventually led to the disarmament of the Great Lakes. And the war itself was good in the sense that it afterwards the relationship between the British and the Americans were good and they are now our biggest ally but it was disastrous for the natives because the land that that was captured in the fighting was never restored and their most important allies the British pretty much abandoned them